So Stephanie, after you hit record, you want me to read this thing, right? Yeah. So, okay. so now we are in record mode. So okay. I need to read this. My name is Laura Drocker and I am the chair of the Energy and Climate Action Committee. Welcome to the meeting of April 22nd, 2020. Based on Governor's Baker's, Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A section 20 and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. I will now take a roll call. Committee members, as you hear your name called, please unmute yourself, answer affirm affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Berger? Here. Drocker, here. DeMont? Here. Durr? Here. Ravi Kumar? Here. Roof? Here. Rose? Here. And Selman? Here. Great. Okay. All right. Um, I, I also have to identify myself. So I'm Stephanie Chicarello, the um, sustainability coordinator for the town of Amherst. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, minutes are also being taken and will be available on the ECAC website um, as they are approved at a subsequent meeting. So members, um, during this meeting, if you could keep yourselves on mute and for better, better stability for the meeting, it would be best if you actually turn your video off unless you're going to speak. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's probably gonna be okay. There's not that many of us. Um, so we can see how this goes, but you know, if you feel like your own personal connection is pretty tenuous, best to turn off your video. Um, and then if you want to be acknowledged, you can raise your hand. Does anybody not know how to use the raise your hand feature? Okay, so then you can just raise your hand um, to be acknowledged. And um, Rachel, um, I'm sorry, uh, Laura will identify you to speak and I, um, and then you can un unmute yourself. And then when you're done speaking, mute yourself again. So um, if there are any technical difficulties at all, I will let you know that um, I've been in two Zoom meetings where I've been dropped from the meeting. So I'm hoping that I as a host don't have that happen. Um, should we run into technical difficulties, things will just basically be on hold till we get it fixed, um, get it put back together, but don't continue conversations um, just in case. Um, you should just put like, everything on hold until we resolve the issue. So um, I think pretty much that's it for the public, um, which we see. We don't seem to have anyone who's um, attending as public because I've pretty much elevated those who are in the attendee frame to panelists because Gazi Kai, I'm including you in that because you're with Linnaean and at some point you may wanna introduce yourself. So um, I think we should be all set. If we do get public um, for the public portion of the meeting, they'll have three minutes. Uh, Lori just announced that we're in the public session of the meeting, segment of the meeting. I'll unmute anybody who is there if they wish to speak and then we'll go back. They'll I'll mute them again and then we'll continue the meeting. So with that, I will um, turn over the agenda to you, Laura, and I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So you'll see very little of me. You're gonna see a lot of all our documents. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Sure. Okay, so the first will be a review and vote to approve the minutes from our 311 meeting, which feels like five years ago. And I don't know if any of us remember anything that happened to that meeting. <laughs> so the minute review will be helpful. Okay. I'll get that up in a sec. Okay, everybody can see those okay? Yes. 
Thumbs up for good. If no one has any comments, um, they can, someone can motion to approve. So moved. Anyone want a second? I can second that. Great. I will second that. Great. So motioned by Ravi Kumar, approved by Breger. So, um, Stephanie, do we need to do a roll call vote? Yes. Okay. Let me find my list of names again here. Um, okay. Uh, any any comments before we vote? Sorry, I've got two screens going, so I'm looking at you even though I'm not looking at you. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to see everybody's picture. Um, okay. So, Breger. A, I. I. Drocker, I. Demont. I. Durr. I. Ravi Kumar. I. Roof. I. Rose. I. Selman. I. Okay. So that's everyone approving, no abstaining, and no absent. Great. Excellent. Can I ask one question? And apologize, um, just because it passed by before. I've been on many, many Zoom calls, like five today, but I've never raised my hand. And I can't figure out how I raise my hand. Okay, so there should be, um, it's easier if I stop sharing my screen so I can see. Um, there is a, um, a panel that you have. And you should have some options at the bottom yeah, I see that. I, I got lots of... Participants. Hit participants. Oh, I go, I do. Yeah, I check this out. I go on participants. Oh, there's, there's a, okay. There's a uh, three, three dots there at the bottom of participants. Gotcha. Okay. Does it give you the option to raise your hand there? Yes. Yes. Yep. Sorry. Yep. All right. So, and then, um, and then you can disable it as well once okay. you're done. Okay. Good. So, or, if you want, you all can just physically raise your hand because Laura can see you. If you put your video on, you can raise your hand. So those are the two options to be acknowledged. So um, so Laura, at this point, you're just sort of taking over um, for the agenda, so. Okay. So. Um, public comment, doesn't look like we have anyone. Is that still true, Stephanie? Yeah. You can okay. So we can skip that. So uh, staff updates. Okay. Um, so updates, uh, I've asked Rachel to update the greenhouse gas emissions inventory to include the information from, um, from Ham uh, Hampshire College because that was the data that we were missing. So although she wasn't able to obtain all of the data, she was able to extrapolate from other years information. So um, did the best she could. And thank you, Rachel, very much for doing that. Um, so we do have an updated inventory that will be useful for our purposes moving forward. Um, we will have her to take minutes for us until it sounds like May 20th. Um, so May 20th would be Rachel's last meeting with us. I also wanted to let you know that the town hired a new facilities manager. He started today. Um, his name is Jeremiah, Jeremiah LaPlante. And were things not in the state of chaos that they are, he would actually be situated in the cubicle right next to mine, which is lovely because it means he and I will be able to um, speak frequently. And that's great. And he will be doing building assessments. 
and he's got an extensive background apparently in energy systems, building energy systems. So really great, really exciting. I'm excited to have somebody who's going to be that close to me so that we can actually work together and more collaboratively, um, which I haven't been able to do as um, easily in the past. And he will be reporting directly to Rob Mora, who is the building commissioner. So that's all really exciting. I'm, I'm really happy that that's happening. I just wish I <laughs> could physically be there so I could meet him. Um, but hopefully this will be over sooner than later. Um, those are my updates so far, uh, other than also to say that the CCA process is moving forward. Um, the committee is meeting now as sort of staff from the three communities with additional members who are essentially the members that have been involved all along, but um, we are moving that effort forward and we have a meeting on Monday in which time I'll give updates um, to that group about where we are with the funding. It's all good news. So um, we'll be moving that effort forward and uh, it's very timely while we are moving this process forward of the climate action adaptation and resiliency planning process. So that's my update. Sorry. Are you still on? Great. Laura? Yeah. There's a child screaming downstairs. So um. <laughs> Mute, having to mute a little bit. Um, any questions for Stephanie? No, great. Okay, then I think we can move on to the meat of our agenda for today, which is the presentation by our new consultants. And so Jim and Lauren, it'd be great if you could introduce yourselves. Maybe Jim, you could give a brief overview of your org. Hey. Um, and then we'll launch into the presentation. Great, I'll let uh, Lauren do the talking. I'll just start, so hi, Jim Newman. Nice to see uh, some old friends and some new folks to meet. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, Lauren. <laughs> sure, um, so my name is Lauren. I am a UMass Amherst alum, so um, this, project has a very special place in my heart. I was lucky enough to be a student of Dwayne's and to work with Stephanie and Andrew both while I was at UMass. Um, I graduated in 2018 with um, my MS in Sustainability Science, which is the same program that Rachel's in. Um, and I focused my studies on um, green infrastructure planning and climate action planning. So this is really my passion. It's very exciting to be here. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, while I was in grad school, I was a summer fellow with the city of Somerville and I helped them to update their greenhouse gas emissions inventories and launch their climate action plan. And since then, I have worked with about a half dozen other um, municipalities in Massachusetts through the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program that Amherst has just um, finished the planning process through and that this grant is a part of. Um, so uh, that's sort of background about me. And then once we launch into the slides, Laura, we do have a slide that um, just is an overview of Linnaean as well. So we can speak a little bit more about the, the firm. Um, yeah, so Stephanie, I know you were going to share your screen with our slides um, whenever you're ready. Would it be possible for you to share the slides with the, with the uh, members too? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we could. I, I can send them. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, Stephanie can probably send them to you right. now while, while right. this is going on. Um, not, uh, yeah, not as easily. <laughs> so, yeah, probably not. Right. Never you mind. Can, you can all look along now, and then I will send them um, as part of, and I'll include them in the packet um, when I post that on the town's website. So while Stephanie is uh, pulling the slides up, um, I'll just introduce myself. I've met a number of you. Uh, I'm Jim Newman. I run Linan Solutions, a uh, principal, principal in charge of this project. Um, as many of you know, uh, Linan has worked on a number of projects similar to this. Uh, you know, all projects, are, you know, towns are different, projects are different, different issues come to the fore. Uh, and there are different ways that towns work on things. 
Uh, we did do uh, a climate, uh, see, what was it called? The uh, Resilience and Regeneration mm -hmm. Plan uh, with Wayne Fiden in Northampton. Uh, we are currently working on a really interesting uh, action and adaptation plan for the cities of Portland and South Portland, Maine together. Uh, and um, have done, we worked in Medford, we worked in a bunch of other, uh, bunch of other cities doing similar things. Uh, we also do a lot of building related work. Uh, um, we uh, are lead homes providers, we're passive house consultants. Uh, so we're working on four passive house projects right now. Um, and so have a lot of expertise around buildings. We have some expertise around infrastructure. Uh, and we have some expertise around uh, uh, um, greenhouse gas inventory, carbon mitigation of various types, including a lot of experience around embodied carbon. Um, so Lauren, why don't you go ahead and jump in? Sure. Um, so this is just a quick overview of what we're gonna go through today um, we're in the midst of introductions and we'll talk a little bit more about our project partners in a moment. Um, and then review some of the background um, work that's already been done in Amherst around climate planning, including all the documents that we've been reviewing. Um, then launch into a discussion about the vision for the plan. Um, and then talk about the process and timeline for the plan. And then last but not least, some next steps. So Stephanie, if you could go to the next slide. So we already covered most of this. Um, I think one other relevant thing to mention is that we're also, um, so Linnean is facilitating the campus climate resiliency planning process for um, UMass Amherst as well right now. So this is kind of a, a cool opportunity to tie together um, or to fit that work into this process as well, um, to connect those dots. And then I think, um, we also forgot to introduce our third team member who's going to be supporting this project, Holly Jacobson. She's not with us today um, because she is deep into the Portland and South Portland um, work and has some deadlines, but um, she was deeply involved with the MVP planning process in Amherst and um, is a resilience consultant on, on the team. Um, so Holly, I'm sure, will be a familiar face by the end of this process too. Um, so next slide, please, Stephanie. Thanks. Jim, this is you. So our partners, um, we have several partners on this process uh, that bring different sets of expertise. A part of our goal as we do uh, a project like this and work, you know, looking at each project, trying to understand what's going to be important here, where, where do we need expertise uh, to fill out a, fill out a, a really solid team. Uh, and so we uh, have partnered on this project with uh, Niche Engineering, who will be represented by Isabel Kaubisch, who is a, a planner and engineer that we've worked with in a couple of different settings. We've worked with Niche a number of times. Niche is a, a women-owned business uh, based in Boston uh, that does infrastructure uh, planning of various sorts. They're a civil engineering firm primarily. Uh, and so come with a lot of infrastructure expertise. Um, and will be helping us uh, with infrastructure and with some of the, the infrastructure uh, procurement issues as we, uh, as we move forward in the project. Um, we also are partnering with uh, the Regenerative Design Group based in Greenfield. Uh, RDG is a permaculture and uh, uh, landscape and agriculture planning firm uh, that um, does work amazingly all over the world, but does a lot of work in the Pioneer Valley as well. Uh, and uh, we're actually currently working with RDG on uh, the Healthy Soils Action Plan for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and so uh, RDG will bring some of that soil carbon, soil health uh, experience to this project. Uh, and then uh, Gazikaya, as um, Stephanie mentioned, Gazikaya and Kosi, is uh, working with us as uh, a, a sort of community participation, community outreach uh, consultant to help us to really connect with a full range of community members and organizations throughout Amherst and the surrounding area to make sure that uh, this work really uh, serves 
a wide range of needs. Thanks, Stephanie. So we wanted to start by reviewing a lot of the great work that has already been done in Amherst to set the stage for this plan. Um, of course, there's the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which it's awesome that um, Rachel is working on updating with the Hampshire data um, that sort of set a baseline, looked at municipal and townwide emissions um, across stationary energy, transportation, waste, and agriculture, and gave a sense of where the community is moving without a bold um, plan for action. And this is really sort of the basis for future greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, and goal setting, progress tracking. Then the MVP planning process um, focused on identifying priorities and, um, sorry, identifying and prioritizing actions that can sustain strengths and reduce vulnerabilities to increase resilience in Amherst. Then of course, there's the work of the Community Choice Aggregation Task Force, um, which is moving forward, uh, which is very exciting, uh, advancing the intermunicipal agreement with Northampton and Pelham. Um, we looked at that report and um, are really inspired by the 3.0 framework, which is ambitious, um, not just about municipal aggregation, but also energy efficiency, renewable generation and storage, social equity, energy democracy. These are all really great values to be bringing into this process. And then of course there's the work of this committee which has not only set bold goals for the um, for the town but um, has done some really great outreach to get a sense of community knowledge, opportunities, barriers, and support for climate action. Um, so the goal here is really to merge all of these processes to address mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. And for that plan ultimately to drive bold climate action. So as we start to sort of dive into this process, um, it'd be, I just think it'd be valuable for you as committee members and us as well uh, to just stop and think for a minute and get a picture in your head. So when you think about Amherst in 30 years, in 2050. What do you see? Like, what are the things you see as part of what that the community is and looks like and feels like uh, as our plans, your plans start to take hold, start to really happen? Uh, what does that change look like? So let's take a sec and just imagine that. And then I'd love to hear a little about what you think. So let's let it sit for a moment. So what do you think? What do you think that you see? What, do you, what is it you have as an image? of Amherst in 30 years, if our work is successful. I'll go. I, yeah, I have a hard time believing nobody has an image in their minds. <laughs> we all do. Um, I, I see a... Um, well developed plan being um, implemented step by step based on clear priorities and um, the next steps already being planned in to um, well, you're saying 30 years. I'm, I'm thinking of 2030. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying 10 years. So um, I mean, 30 years, the whole uh, world economy has to be completely clean and drawing down. So there's our vision, right? Uh, I have to admit that I have part of my vision of Amherst in 30 years is a really vibrant, uh, I have this vision of a, a, 
uh, a series of uh, mid-size agricultural operations with people arriving to take care of take care of fields and do planning and do processing and then that food being going out to uh, distribution processes, different centers and buildings sort of within the community and primarily staying within the community uh, as, as a way that the community sort of feeds itself, does that work in a, in a really climate positive way and uh, has sort of transformed the economy of how, of one piece of what people do in Amherst. That's sort of, it's like, that's the little vision I have in my head. Uh, it's kind of driven by some, you know, a number of different things. Uh, but do others have, uh, others have similar visions? Jesse had his hand up. Oh, good. Yeah, sorry, I'm not. Hi, hi, Jim and Lauren. Um, Jesse Selman, I'm a Amherst resident. I, thought, I want to maybe just say quickly that as so we all can get to know each other maybe if we give if we have something to say we just give a quick little i i uh i also went to umass go minimum <laughs> and uh i live in town as you know i'm i think it's admittedly it is hard to jump to 30 years um with the sense of urgency and i think a couple two points i'd make about though trying to push myself to be 30 when I'm 76, I think very important that this vision that I'm having, like it, the idea that it's Amherst feels tricky to me. Mm. And I think anything that we envision in Amherst in the, it has to, if, if it's going to be anything even close to what I, we want, that vision has to spill regionally, globally, et cetera. And so thinking about our neighbors uh, near and far is one. And, and the other vision I have is, I think is very much, not sure what it looks like the physical space, but the, in our hearts, a different culture potentially, and a different way of being and a different understanding of, ex different expectations of, of what we deserve, what, you know, what we should have. I think there's like a real kind of inner change that um, that I think we I would love to see that is um, generous and loving and kind and courageous. Um, and I'll leave it at that. It's a pretty beautiful vision. Um, I, I have to say, uh, Jesse, that uh, first high is nice to see it. Um, uh, the idea of leadership not to leaders, but leadership to help move the things that need to move, uh, I think is a really, really fantastic vision. Um, uh, you know, it, so often we sort of think of the process of leadership as, okay, we're going to be recognized as leaders. And to some extent, the town of Amherst doesn't need to be recognized as a leader. It's got lots going on, but to be a leader in how things, how communities are moving, how the valley is moving, how the, the region is moving, uh, that's pretty valuable. Great, so I see uh, Steve and then Darcy. Great. Okay. I the, the vision that popped into my head was sort of centered around downtown, but a much more walkable downtown without cars or very few cars and efficient light rail or light um, public transportation. And I sort of thought, of, I thought about the trolley that we had oh, about a hundred years ago, um, how, how nice that would be to have back again today, something that runs through town and allows people to easily get from one edge of town to another. So I'm visioning a, a spring day in downtown Amherst with trails leading from one shop to another and patches of gardens and trees and people walking and bicycling and every now and then some kind of a quiet, efficient uh, public transport vehicle um, rolls on by. 
That's a great vision. That is a great vision. Darcy? Uh, I just wanted to mention, and um, I'm I'm one of the the now one council members on the on the committee. We're hopefully going to get another one, but that's that's another issue. Um, but I just wanted to let you know. You probably do already know that we we conducted an outreach process that kind of goes to the question that you asked. So I think everybody really has had a lot of time to think about, you know, what, what is our vision for, for 20, 2030 and 2050. And um, for, for me, a lot of it has been around, you know, just uh, trying to um, figure out how we can make a pretty wholesale culture change, um, getting people just to think about what we're doing in a different way and you know electrifying everything electrifying the transportation and the building sectors is huge um, I mean I think that's uh, as far as mitigation that's going to be what does the most is just transitioning everybody out of uh, fossil fuel po powered cars and heating um, and in our area you know, having a lot of this kind of spearheaded by the new CCA entity that is going to come online and is going to hopefully um, regionally organize a lot of these efforts that we're going to have. Great. Ashwin? Um, so hi, I'm Ashwin uh, Ravi Kumar. I teach at Amherst College. I've been living in Amherst for uh, over two years now. Um, and thank you for your work on this. It's great to hear from you. Uh, it's interesting because we, in some of the outreach events that we did, framed the, question, uh, fr framed the activities that we did with participants in a similar way. We really asked people in town to tell us about what their vision was for the future. Um, and that was instructive, and I think it informs some of what my own vision would be, although, as others have said, 30 years is a long time. But in a version of 30 years from now that is uh, humane and has not succumbed to the worst excesses of unfettered climate barbarism that we might all kind of collectively dread, <clears throat> I would envision the town of Amherst uh, as being a welcoming refuge for people from around the world uh, and for people who have uh, perhaps been displaced for climate and other reasons from New York cities, to live in abundant, high quality, dense public housing uh, that is close to uh, amenities in town with the universities and colleges serving as resources to train people for growing new economies for a sustainable future that are hard to foresee right now. Um, I foresee agriculture being part of that. Uh, I would like to I guess, emphasize that the vision of the future that I have for 30 years from now is not everything as it is now, except with more renewable electricity and electric cars instead of normal cars, but rather something much more fundamentally different. Well, then that gets on our way, baby. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that's a great, um, a great description. And we're, um, as Lauren, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, we spent quite a lot of time uh, looking at the material, the, the outreach material, the information that came out of the process, the surveys. Um, that uh, that was great work, uh, and as uh, you know, clearly the committee has done a lot of work uh, getting to the point where we kind of walk in. Uh, um, you know, we we are very clear that that we're not starting a process, we're, uh, we are part of continuing a process along. Um, and that work is quite, quite a beautiful and, uh, and there's just so much information there. Um, lots and lots of, lots of feeling and heart as well, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, thanks, anybody else? Yeah, we've got one more, Dwayne, and then I think, that's everybody. You can move on. Yeah. Maybe. Sarah, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to say. No need to say something unless you feel. Yeah, just quickly. So I, um, yeah. Just uh, 
pile on with with all the other visions as well and just say <laughs> hi to uh, to Lauren it's great to, to see you out there and hi mm. Jim uh, uh, Dwayne I live in town I work at UMass and I, we may have crossed paths I was at DOER for 13 years uh, before uh, being at uh, UMass here I bet we have yeah, yeah yep um, so great to have uh, have you guys on board um, I guess one thing I wanted to bring to the vision was um, to some extent, I hope things just physically don't change that much. I mean, I live here because it's a beautiful town. Um, it has history um, and, uh, um, and it has modern uh, stuff um, and the aesthetics of the town are very um, uh, drawing. I don't, I hope the town commons is still a robust town commons. It's been one for 400 years or whatever. Um, and the downtown uh, core is very uh, quaint. Uh, there's certainly some upgrades and so forth. I do see a robust, um, um, work that needs to be done and that's part of the vision over hopefully pretty much done in 30 years but it's going to take probably most of that time to um, retrofit all the buildings we got in town. Um, I do see uh, new construction but most of the buildings are already built and need uh, a lot of work uh, so it is this uh, electrification um, though you know to some extent I hope the aesthetics don't change that much uh, it doesn't need to. Um, but um, again, I think it's, uh, as sort of has been mentioned, a lot of the change and vision is not so much physical, but um, psychological and emotional and just uh, people's um, uh, relationship to energy uh, and climate um, and really a, a, an opportunity for this relationship to be much more direct where people really um, understand and, and uh, uh, take pride and in, in ownership uh, in, in a very um, financial way as well. Uh, in energy um, activities uh, and assets in town. Uh, that can be done through the CCA, for example, uh, is what we're looking at. Um, and, uh, but also just have a consciousness about them that is not um, necessarily explicit and we don't wear it on our sleeves all the time, but it's just part of the way that we go about doing business. Um, I do, um, I, my vision is that uh, there still will be a lot of, of um, car-based transportation uh, as opposed to public, I don't know if if um, uh, we really have the wherewithal to, um, you know, every time I want to run into town to um, take out food uh, to jump on it, on uh, on um, uh, public transportation. Uh, but um, but quiet, small, personal, um, maybe autonomous vehicles, uh, maybe on call vehicles that come to us when we need them um, would be um, super. I could use one when I'm uh, 30 years older. <laughs> yeah, I have to think of how old I'm going to be when I'm 30 years. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, hmm. uh, in that case, yeah, I'll take that uh, um, uh, that autonomous vehicle. Is that everyone? Yeah, I think we're good. Do you want to? Awesome. I All just right. wanted to add my um, comment into the mix, which was as I was reading through some of the interviews that the committee has done with um, with various folks around town. Uh, I remember reading a quote from Gabrielle Gould, I think, with the Business Improvement District about um, a, a vibrant and thriving downtown, supporting local businesses while also furthering um, climate mitigation goals. And I just thought that was pretty inspiring because um, Amherst does have so much great culture and um, history as we mentioned and having that as um, sort of a cultural gateway into um, some of the, the cultural changes that we're talking about I think is, um, is something inspiring. Um, I certainly feel like the arts has a big role to play. Um, and I to take a sec and just say, you know, in this funny moment, and uh, and this funny moment has shown us a few things. It's shown us where uh, where we're kind of lacking, where things are not working well. It's also shown us that we can do things that we didn't think we could do, and um, and it's shown us that things can change very quickly, and. I, I think it's just, it, we just need to keep that in our minds and kind of in our approach that we're looking to do some big things. Those big things may be hard to imagine, 
But if there's one we've seen in the last month, things can happen that nobody had any idea might be able to happen. So yeah, we, that works on way. many fronts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some are good and some are bad. A lot of them are not so great. Uh, but, um, but it's very true. And I just appreciate everybody being up for this and ready to take on a, you know, some really don't know where we're going. And that's the perfect segue to our next slide. <laughs> um, actually see. So, um, Lauren, you want to talk about this? No. I think this is yeah. uh, <laughs> um, So we're trying to do this in a very uh, interactive way. Uh, <laughs> if you remember the MVP process, uh, Holly and I were very good at this as well. Uh, and so we all have this sort of system back and forth. Um, so uh, the vision here is there's several things that have come out of both uh, your work and the setup for this process, which was then, uh, which was then sort of uh, uh, expressed in the RFP and expressed in uh, the process of getting here, and then in uh, our initial sort of uh, um, uh, kickoff conversation with um, Stephanie and Laura, uh, that sort of really brought that forward. So the idea is to really build this process into an integrative climate planning framework, which is has strong you know, obviously we're focused on mitigation and we need to be focused on resilience and adaptation. And if there's one thing we have seen in the last month is that resilience and adaptation is not a joke. It's, this is serious stuff. Um, uh, we all, it's also been very clear, uh, both from the MVP process and the documentation out of that, as well as from the work that you did uh, it, already around outreach, uh, that this needs to, have a strong equity focus and to have a strong community drive to it. Uh, and so that's something we're very focused on doing in, a, in uh, ways that are, probably, that are probably different than what you're expecting. Um, I talked a little bit about what that means, but our goal is not to uh, have a giant community participation process, though there may be some of that. Uh, our goal is to get authentic participation uh, in the process of defining what a plan means and then defining what the strategies are so that it's not a surprise to anybody. It's something that means thing, it, the, the meaning is built as we go along. Uh, obviously, a key part of this building a tracking process so that the plans updated over time. That's key. That is always key. Uh, and then we want to make sure we identify goals and strategies that are meetable, that are that we can make our way to, and that drive us forward uh, over time. Uh, part of that is uh, identifying sort of what are the changes and actions that need to happen with uh, town budgeting and potentially staffing. It sounds like some of that work has already started to move forward. And, uh, and then also, you know, the, the funding process for a lot of these is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be a trick for, for a town the size of Amherst but it's not impossible. And there's many different ways to approach these, uh, the things that uh, everybody sees needs to be done. Great, um, Steve and Ashwin, do you guys still have comments or have new comments or questions? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, that's okay, I can't figure, I don't think I can turn your hand off, so. No, you have to turn your own, yeah. Okay, I'll drop my hand. You're welcome to speak. Well, <laughs> please, uh, absolutely, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and holler to stop us if you need to, or uh, or raise your hand, or uh, yeah, any number of ways to. Uh, it's a small enough group. I think we can we can stand everybody talking. Um, uh, Lauren. <laughs> Um, so as Jim mentioned, of course, we're focused on mitigation in this plan in a big way. These are just the goals that the community has recommended to the town. Um, 
town is adopted, 50% reductions townwide by 2030, um, with an interim goal of 25% reductions by 2025, and carbon neutrality no later than 2050, but preparing for carbon neutrality sooner than that. Um, and that will involve a lot of different strategies that will be developed over the course of this plan, um, as well as advocacy at the state and federal levels and adoption of new technologies. So these goals are really clear, they're well defined, they're based in science, they're measurable, they're actionable, and they're time frame, which makes them really great goals. Um, so Stephanie, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so we wanted to tee up a bit more of a discussion around resilience in Amherst and what that means um, in the context of this plan. Obviously, the MVP planning work has, um, will be feeding into this in a major way, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But um, we wanted to start off just with this definition of resilience from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, Lauren, they have it. Lauren, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your, your sound okay. is coming in and out. It's hard, a little hard okay. to hear. Um, one also, second. everyone should, I'm sorry, Lauren, everyone else should make sure that they're muted as well. I think I'm just going to take my headphones out because sometimes they are not the best. Okay, can everyone still hear me? Okay, this should be a little better. Um, so. Just wanted to tee up a conversation about resilience in Amherst um, with this first definition from the Rockefeller Center uh, Foundation, sorry, which is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city or town to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. So we're talking about acute stressors and acute shocks and chronic stressors. So how do we um, face sudden hazards, but also new daily stresses as they arise? And then we're talking about surviving, adapting, and growing. So how do we increasingly thrive as a community, not just recover when things happen? Um, some aspects of resilience are gonna fall entirely outside of the realm of mitigation. Like the classic example is stormwater infrastructure, um, which doesn't really tie in with carbon reduction, unless maybe if you're talking about green infrastructure, but is so critical from the resilience standpoint. Um, and whereas other resilience considerations will overlap with mitigation, such as um, passive survivability in buildings and energy efficiency. Um, so Stephanie, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so what does resilience look like for Amherst? These are drawn directly from the um, MVP planning report. Um, so in purple, we have infrastructure resilience priorities. In pink, we have societal, uh, societal resilience priorities. And in green, we're environmental resilience priorities that were identified through that process. And I thought this would just be a good way to sort of bring it back to um, what, what came out of that process, what were the priorities that were identified by the community during that process. Um, and it was things like resilient food production and distribution systems that we talked about. A lot of these things are related to everyone's visions. Um, empowerment of vulnerable populations, um, sustainable and resilient buildings, um, water infrastructure and water security. These are all things that we're gonna wanna be addressing over the course of this process. Um, so before we get into talking about resilience goals, we wanted to give a couple of examples of what resilience goals might look like for Amherst. Um, since we have these really robust and clear carbon reduction goals um, and resilience goals, we, we want to start to think about how to frame resilience goals in ways that are as actionable and time framed and, and, um, and reflective of the community um, as the carbon mitigation goals are. So Stephanie, if you could go to the next slide. I just have a couple more slides that are examples that we've pulled from other contexts that we've worked in of resilience goals and then some of the potential indicators that we could look at to consider um, whether those goals are being met. 
or how we will know that those goals are being met. So in this case, um, the sort of sector that was being explored was social equity and governance. And an example goal could be that decisions at the local level involve extensive consultation with stakeholders, residents, community partners, and others affected by decisions. And the decision-making process is transparent and accountable. And potential indicators to track how that goal is being met is are things like the town has a protocol in place for consultation with stakeholders and the local community reports that decisions are made in a transparent and accountable way. Um, that's just one example. Yeah, these are examples from other settings uh, mm -hmm. and uh, are not necessarily reflective of uh, the goals that we want to set, but they're but they provide really good ways to think about, well, what does a goal look like and how do you know whether you're getting there? Exactly, thanks, John. Um, so Stephanie, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, it's just another example from another context um, for infrastructure and environment resilience goals. So, that could look something like a goal where the natural environment and the built environment in town work together to make both the local community and local ecosystems more resilient. And some indicators of that might be the percentage of applicable areas in town that use nature-based solutions to address stormwater, high heat, um, resilience to wind and storms, and improvement of air quality or water quality and maybe the percentage of applicable areas in town where the design and management of open spaces support healthy ecosystems and healthy soils. Um, so these are really just examples, as Jim said, to um, start thinking about how to frame resilience goals and, and potential indicators that can help us track progress over time. Um, and I guess this is probably a good place to stop and see if anyone has any initial um, thoughts on that, um, initial reactions to that framing around resilience goals. Does that resonate for folks? <laughs> Everyone's still mulling um, it over. Jesse. No news is good news, yeah. That's the last one, yeah. I'm going to try not to be too irritating. Um, <laughs> it's not easy. Jump in. Yeah. I, it, there, I, I think in general, I am feeling a, and having reviewed a lot of the material, the previous plans, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, there's a certain generality to a lot of the language. Uh, which I find challenging, and and I think if if I think you're going to find this is a this is a smart group that's thought about this a lot. I think we're pretty well along, and and I know that what we're looking at might not be something for us as much as for a town, but I'm there's a the general language to me is displacing a sense of urgency. And I think that's gonna be the, my phrase potentially um, of this is, is I, I am craving extremely actionable, extremely nuts and bolts, extremely not plan on a shelf. And I'm not accusing you guys of doing this, but one of the things I had said at a previous meeting was like, if we could have our climate action plan be five pages long and not 50, that sounds like a win to me. Um, it, it just, I don't, I'm nervous about get, getting buried in language. And, and I don't really know, as you can see, as I ramble on how to finish this concept. And I'm betting Ashwin has a better end to this than me. So I'm gonna stop, but I, I, I feels general. I will feedback, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I have a totally better, you know, suggestion coming out of this. Um, the generality of the language did strike me as well. Um, and I mean, I think part of maybe what's not here, and maybe this is something that will be clearer in the document, but I would uh, just want to emphasize that it would be great to make sure that it's really clear, uh, is how do these goals depart from past trends and future projections under status quo? 
um, what is the problem that we were trying to fix? Because that's how we get pointed towards specific alternatives that we want to implement. Um, and it's, it's a little hard, or it's, it's really hard to see what that gap, what those gaps might be between the alternatives, between our desires and what we project will happen given past trends without uh, positive interventions from just this language. So I would uh, very much look forward to seeing more specificity around that. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important note for a few different reasons, but one of which is just that resiliency goals, as you've both pointed out, do tend to be a little bit less sort of concrete than um, carbon goals. And I'm hearing that specificity is really the name of the game for this committee. So um, that's, that's awesome. It's really great. To yeah. Hear. And I mean, I think if I am reading your presentation correctly, this is just to note that you haven't seen in our link in our initial goals resiliency, which is true. It's not in those goals specifically, mm -hmm. and that we do need to include resiliency in our action plan, which I think we all also agree with. Um, so I think in that sense, we're on the same page, but our goals will look different and be more specific and actionable to the extent that they can be. Um, and we'll build in resiliency to the extent that they can as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that you, uh, that's exactly right. So yes, the, the work so far out of the committee does not really have much to say about resilience goals. Uh, and that, uh, you know, carbon and carbon mitigation is very countable, makes it very easy. Uh, things that are not countable directly are a little bit harder. As I used to say, uh, you know, uh, the, the easy parts of this are you need bigger culverts, we'll give you a storm size uh, that you need to design to. You can do that. Uh, um, the hard parts are uh, social issues. It's really hard to count that stuff. Um, uh, and Ashwin did a great job of el elucidating what, are, what social issues are we talking about? So we're going to want to set some really pretty specific goals and ways to count those social issues as well, because we know that social uh, resilience is a key to how a community uh, moves forward. Ashwin, you were about to say something. Oh, sorry. No, I, I don't think I was. Um, no. I think I think we're good. Um, okay, good. And so obviously we yeah. need to set those those goals. You know, a part of what we're doing here is we're just kind of pushing and saying, okay, here's some other things. It's like, all right, you don't like those so good. Well, let's pick some better ones. That's great. Yeah, Stephanie. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the resiliency piece is important, especially in light of where we are right now. And some of the things that it has really brought to the forefront and what I'm experiencing and I'm sure others are is just the incredible inequity of how we're communicating right now. So I feel like one of the pieces of resiliency in terms of what, you know, it's a, a piece of what we're doing in terms of climate action is that we do have to look at communication, which came up as a very primary issue for um, a very different, definite segment of the town's population saying that that piece needs to be addressed as part of resiliency. And this is important because if we're talking about climate emergencies as we move forward, communication is a piece of that. And even though it doesn't seem like it's specifically a carbon issue, it most certainly is an equity issue. Um, so it is related and it is important to build that into the resilience. And again, a reminder that this process is um, funded by MVP. And so resiliency kind of has to be a piece of this. And some of those issues should be addressed because they were identified by community members. Can I just add real, real quick there that uh, I, I totally think that resilience in the plan, having resilience in the plan is essential. Um, it's incredibly valuable. Uh, the vitality of it is is on display right now. Um, in some ways, I actually think that um, we might even be able to think bigger uh, with what we mean by resilience than what is in these goals. Um, 
because for a long time, a lot of conversations about adaptation have turned on green infrastructure. I love green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is great. Um, but given the magnitude of effects that climate change is likely to have, it's not just having culverts and green infrastructure to be resilient to more, se more severe and more frequent flooding events, but also potentially disruptions to supply chains, uh, events that really knock things out in town. Um, and you know, what will the municipality be able to do to deal with those kinds of situations? Uh, how are we gonna build capacity for, again, potentially refugees? Is that something that we can be thinking about? Um, and another thing that just kind of came to mind in terms of resiliency during the current crisis um, is that a lot of like kind of informal mutual aid networks have sprung up uh, in Western Massachusetts, also really around the country and world, uh, to provide services, peer-to-peer -peer help for people that like need groceries, uh, to have wellness checks, lots of stuff like that. And I found myself in trying to find ways to plug in right now, uh, kind of wishing that I could plug in through the municipality without having to rely on these sort of informal mutual aid networks, which as much as I laud them, uh, I think tend to replicate existing kind of structural inequalities and exacerbate some of the inequities that come with uh, a pandemic or an, any kind of an emergency. So are there ways to also think about having robust data and information on who's where and who is vulnerable and how uh, we can come together to help our most vulnerable residents in times of crisis? Yeah, totally. And I would add to that the, the, the infrastructure of people, like culvert, like, I'd rather have 10 more Stephanie's than a culvert. And, mm -hmm. right, and I think realizing that this human beings who are trained and capable and communicative and understand this, like ready to go. Yeah, um, thanks Jesse. And just, you know, flagging that, and it was in the slides earlier, but you know, communication and robust communication networks was definitely brought up during the MVP workshop in as part of that document. Um, so I think that's only being further recognized during this time. Absolutely. And to Ashwin's point too, around, um, you know, broadening the definition of resilience, thinking about things like food security and food justice, um, which was another thing that came up frequently in the MVP process. So these are all really, really great. Okay, um, any last comments before we move on? Awesome. Okay, um, then next slide. Yeah. Okay, Stephanie. So this slide um, is intended to sort of outline and tee up a discussion around phase one of this project, which obviously has had to be recast given our present circumstances um, with COVID-19. But we learned when we had our initial um, conversation with Laura and Stephanie that the ECAC has already been thinking about working within a sort of working group structure um, to advance sector uh, analysis um, for the plan. So we are proposing maybe four task groups based around four broad sectors, um, which we'll talk more in depth about in a moment. And the idea is for each task group to be co-chaired by two members of the committee um, with Linnaean staff taking care of the logistics and facilitation for meetings. And we probably aim to have somewhere around three meetings um, over the course of the next few months, um, starting in late May, early June. And um, other task group members might include folks like other town staff, um, resident experts, community organization representatives, and other community members who are interested and excited about this work. Um, those task group members would probably be identified by the town and the committee with support from us and from Gazit Kaya um, as the community outreach liaison. Um, and I'm gonna just go through the rest of the slide first, but then circle back to this idea of sectors um, for a little bit more discussion. So phase one um, will have the task groups 
as a focal point. We're also aiming to do a lot of community participation planning to be ready to really hit the ground running once that becomes feasible again. Um, and then we also are proposing two other analyses that will be led by our partners um, that we think could serve as meaningful complements to the existing plan framework that the committee has drafted. So the first is a soil health and soil carbon analysis led by our generative design group that we talked about at the beginning based in Greenfield. And that is meant to look at soil health and soil carbon in the town and lead to a series of recommendations for in integrating soil resilience into land use planning efforts, um, like the master plan, um, open space and recreation plan, zoning and bylaws, things like that. And to provide a framework for Amherst to be able to become eligible for participation in programs like carbon credits and payment for ecosystem services. And that kind of ties into this examination of alternative and innovative funding models. Um, then the second analysis that we're proposing is an infrastructure resilience and procurement analysis, which would be led by niche engineering. And um, that would lead to strategies and recommendations that would support resilient low carbon infrastructure planning. Um, and that would also help to inform task group discussions and further conversations around resilience. So that's our sort of initial um, proposal for phase one. And I wanted to circle back to this idea of sectors because we looked through the initial um, climate action plan draft that the committee has put together. And um, we're trying to think about how to um, how to structure some task groups, working groups in an integrative way that makes sense, that makes it um, easier to set goals and track um, progress over time, makes that process more intuitive, and also covers all the bases that the committee has already identified as being critical to this plan. So um, these are just proposals and they're definitely um, open for discussion. Um, but sort of our initial thinking was that we could have four task groups built around these sectors. So buildings and energy, which would include community choice aggregation, which is obviously going to be a critical component of this plan. Um, transportation and other infrastructure. So that would include things like water and wastewater infrastructure, communications infrastructure, which of course, as Stephanie just mentioned, is critical from the resilience and equity standpoints. And then land use and natural systems, which would include um, agriculture, of course, um, forestry, um, open space, things like that, and ecosystem health, and then community and public health, which was something that we proposed as an addition to the framework that the committee has been working with, um, especially in light of the current uh, coronavirus pandemic, but then also thinking about um, vector-borne disease and other infectious diseases and how those relate to climate change, um, and then potentially some um, some more work around food systems, less from the agricultural side of things and more from the um, distribution and uh, systems perspective. So um, yeah, I guess we can open it up here as well uh, for the committee's feedback on these um, draft buckets. I see Darcy's hand. I think you're muted. I'm just wondering if your vision for the sector-based task groups um, with the first meeting in May is um, designed sort of like the MVP outreach only targeted to those four areas or, or, or something different from that? Um, Jim, do you want to comment? Yeah. So um, the, the idea of the, the task groups is that there are a couple of things that have to happen, right? We, we're just talking about goals and, and indicators. That's something that the task groups are gonna have to really drive. That's not something that we as consultants can drive. Uh, we're here to help the, the decision process happen and to provide as much information as we can to sort of facilitate the process. Uh, and then, you know, we'll write it up and make it look cool. Uh, um, the, um, but the task groups really need to do that work around, okay, what are the things we think are important and how do we, how are we going to track them? 
and at least deciding what we think are important, we may, it may take a couple of shots to figure out how we track them. Um, but that whole question of how we make uh, the goals and actions specific and actionable and, and, and yet big, uh, that, that has, that's essential to the task group. So the first part of those is gonna be that, and then there's gonna be a process of reviewing information as it comes in to make sure that we're making the correct sets of decisions. So how do you see this group um, fitting into the task groups? So I, uh, I can goal, answer that. Oh, Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Um, so my thought is that there's eight of us and four sectors. So we would have two co-chairs of these task groups as two members of each of our committee. Um, and then uh, there's, a, uh, there's ongoing committee meetings right, in which this process is brought back into the committee for a general discussion by the committee is sort of on regular intervals. I'm not super sure what the committee uh, schedule is uh, at this point. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that nobody does, uh, but, um, uh, but that's sort of the model. So there's these uh, satellites that are the, the task groups, uh, which meet, as we were saying, two, three, probably three times sort of over the course of the whole process. Um, and then there's the, the sort of mothership of the committee and, uh, and Stephanie that are sort of holding the whole thing. So I just want to quickly add that um, from this point on, we're going to meet regularly every other week as we have been. It's just going to be virtually. So our Great. schedule is back on track in terms of our meetings. Um, everything else that happens will happen outside of the, you know, on the off weeks. Okay. Great. Dwayne had his hand raised and then Andra. Yeah, thanks. Um, this looks good. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily, I, there's nothing here that I don't think is important. Um, but I did want to uh, sort of just bring up the issue of sort of proportionality uh, in terms of, um, you know, where to put, um, more effort than others. Um, and I think I'm always sort of drawn to um, the, the task in front of us, which at least from the carbon mitigation side is how do we um, get from uh, where we are now to essentially carbon neutral in 30 years or so. And so there's a few things here that um, particularly in these sectors that stand out much larger than others uh, in terms of um, what, both in terms of the magnitude of carbon as well as uh, to some extent the complexity of scrubbing it out um, and uh, while all and, and I think all of them all of them would need sort of community participation um, for sure and the sector-based task force but I would just like to um, you know suggest that, that um, there really needs uh, I, I would like to sort of see more um, as we move forward some sense of uh, proportionality and, and I'm not suggesting you're not thinking along those lines but just in terms of where uh, where we put more effort than others uh, in terms of getting to the, an actionable plan to get to where we need to go. That's great, Dwayne. Um, the one th I, uh, that we can't, I don't know how to say this, but I'm just going to say it. Heck with it. I'm, uh, um, so obviously buildings and energy is like, is the key sector from the, from the carbon mitigation perspective. Although transportation is also a really big sector. So those two are, are really big in terms of mitigation. But the other thing is that this whole idea of soil carbon really lands in the land use section. And it, you know, if you look at soil carbon and soil carbon potential for sequestration, it's about as big as the transfer, transportation sector in the town. Uh, and so it turns out that those three are actually pretty well weighted in terms of uh, in terms of mitigation potential, uh, and that you know we haven't really talked about the soil health thing, but but uh, there's a lot of work going on in this right now, and uh, Amherst is in an interesting position where it has this very diverse land use uh, uh, structure that makes it, um, it rend uh, makes it is the wrong word, but allows it to be, uh, uh, to, to do a lot in this 
uh, in this realm of land use understanding, carbon sequestration, conservation, and what development looks like in terms of carbon uh, sequestration that uh, I think is gonna turn out to be pretty powerful in this process. Uh, and so the, the place where probably mitigation really does not play is in community and public health. But if you think about community and community design, which is really about land use, there may be some issues there as well, but certainly those three categories are the strong ones in terms of mitigation. Yeah, and I would, I would add that um, I think my vision, sort of what I've been envisioning and what we've talked about as a group and to Jesse's point earlier, like I really want our plan to have a very concise executive summary that has like in the next three years, these are the main things we're going to focus on. And that's going to pull, and it may be that all, all of those come from just one or one and a half of these sectors, right? And then the rest of them we're looking at longer term things or things we need to do that are more collective in, in nature and or things that we need to push for policies at the state or national level to do. Um, so, Duane, I think that's a really important point um, you, you noted there. Yeah. Uh, Andra, you had your hand raised. Oh, sorry, could I um, say one thing on that before yeah. we move on? Um, I also just wanted to add, as we're thinking about um, the procurement analysis, that that's another place where um, carbon mitigation is going to come into play. Um, a lot of the work that um, we're hoping NICHE will do, or we're envisioning NICHE will do, is around low carbon procurement. Um, which can actually have quite a significant footprint. Um, so I think that's another important thing to note. And then Duane, you, you brought up community participation and I really just wanted to um, touch on that and also like smack myself on the wrist because um, I had wanted to say this from the beginning of this discussion and because it's by no means an afterthought, but um, community participation as well as equity are really things that we've heard from Stephanie and Laura and from the work of the committee are things that really need to be embedded within all of these sectors. Um, so that's something that we're very cognizant of and um, we'll make sure is at the forefront of the process. So sorry, Andrea, I cut you off. Yeah, um, it's very much along the same lines as um, everyone else saying here. Um, I do think that we should consider um, the timeliness of each of these in terms of how much of the, t the, the committee members' energy should go into it. Um, if we want to have a lot of detail um, in the building and energy section, then um, we should have more people involved in that and um, if some things are more long-term um, and dependent on other factors, um, for instance, transportation is really a regional issue here. Amherst doesn't have its own um, transportation system. We, we have a regional bus system um, and anything we do has to be done in, in that context so I don't, I'm just not sure about the, the four groups. I don't see them as equally weighted. So, so Andra, so just to clarify, because I don't know, maybe this wasn't super clear. Um, so the idea here is, if I understand it, is that we've got these four groups with two members of the committee as co-chairs, but the groups are actually going to include people from our community. We've talked for a long time, I think even from the first meeting about the need to bring in other experts from our community. And so, so yeah, so it, we may find, but, and we've had people in our community interested in all of these areas. And we may find that the building and energy group requires a lot more input. Um, but I, I don't think that I would necessarily say there should be only one committee member as a chair of one of these groups and three of another. Um, so does that answer your question, Andra? And I think this also means that maybe our consultants are spending more time with those groups than they are with some of the other groups. If, that, if, if we come to find out that we're, we're feeling like we're overwhelmed in one area and, and underwhelmed in another. 
I, I think that probably buildings and energy will need to be broken out in order for us to get a handle on it. Oh, that may well be true. Um, the one thing I did want to add to, to Laura's comment there is just that um, we're, we're talking about the proportionality from the mitigation standpoint, but I think it's also important to bring resilience back into the picture um, in this discussion because resilience is going to play a bigger role in things like public health and possibly land use and, and natural systems, and even in buildings and energy, of course, but um, I think we can't forget about that piece of the puzzle as well. Um, Jim, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna say that uh, I'll sort of make the, the point I made before a little, in a little bit different way, that uh, if you were, uh, in fact, we can do this uh, to sort of lay out the sectors of carbon emissions for the town uh, with a wider view and added uh, soil carbon losses uh, and or gains and uh, added uh, procurement uh, emb embodied uh, emissions, which of course, the nice thing about embodied emissions is that they're emissions that uh, were released before you started. And so, Embodied emissions happens instantaneously, as opposed to reducing building emissions, which happens over 30 years. Uh, and um, that what you'd find is that those three things that I just outlined were about equal in size. Uh, and that while we're thinking about buildings and we're thinking about energy systems, uh, there are some things out here that are going to have as least as much effect as those are in terms of overall uh, carbon emissions at the large scale. Uh, and the concept of uh, procurement, uh, and I know that it's a topic that's come up because we've, we've seen it in some of the notes. Um, uh, the concept of procurement at the town level is something that is actually quite, uh, you know, the time frame on that could be relatively quick. Um, and so it's sort of an interesting opportunity to uh, have a pretty big effect relatively easily without a, I mean, it's not talking about spending money to do it either. Uh, and there aren't a whole lot of things that fall into the category of places where you can have a huge carbon effect without spending a lot of money. Uh, although, uh, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about community choice aggregation as well, is that it has a big effect and it's, it's not like you really have to spend money to, uh, to achieve it. Um, there's probably some, but not much. Uh, but we totally hear the thought about uh, sort of uh, building systems and energy systems being uh, the things that the committee cares the most about. Um, and uh, we, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm not sure. I, I would just put a quick plug in for, I'm not sure I necessarily agree. I, I agree with the, the concept that the, the building systems and energy systems are huge and they're complex and will require a lot of time. I, I think I like the way you guys have put it together because I don't see any positive change in that sector without the community sector as well this is what what percentage of this is in private hands most <laughs> so and and the municipality is what three percent so i think i i think i would just nothing against the comments about the buildings but constantly reminding ourselves that um the community is going to do that um and so that communication and that engagement and that justice and resilience piece i think i just see them as all Kind of going together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Darcy, you had a comment as well? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, um, to you know, I, I hear what Jim is saying about um, the, the value of doing things that we can do quickly and easily and for low cost. Uh, but I think that um, the level 
of, and Jesse just said this too, the, you know, the level of complexity around the buildings issue when you're dealing with new construction and you're dealing with retrofitting existing construction, uh, building code issues, et cetera, that's really big and complex about where to go with that. And, and then the energy is equally complex. So I, I, I also find it difficult to think of having them together. Um, uh, but I, I also hear what you're saying about, you know, that, and maybe that just we have, we have, we're hopefully going to have nine people on our committee. So maybe we can have five of these task groups. And one of them have one, one chair or something like that. I don't know. Jesse, anyone else want to weigh in before we move on? I just, um, it's Stephanie here. I just, one thing I wanted to add to is to be thoughtful about the time that this will take. So for any one person to take on a specific group is going to be a lot of weight and the lift on one person. So that's, I think, why when we initially had the conversation about how these might be broken down, it was identified as having two people because maybe you have a buildings and energy group, but maybe there might be ways that there could be sort of a subgroup of that sector that sort of works on a specific piece, but overall the, the effort is to work together, but there might be some work that one of the members could take on and one of the other members could take on. So it doesn't necessarily separate them, but there may be specific pieces they can do individually and then bring them back to that sector group as a whole. Let's um, let's go on to the next slide, and then I want to we'll, we'll go ahead through this stuff, talk about the timeline, things like that, and then we can just sort of come back to a general discussion about this and, and figure out how you guys want to make these decisions. Stephanie, go and get to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is um, th this sort of a diagram about community participation. And the, what we were saying before is that the concept of community participation is, uh, you know, you guys did a bunch of outreach and it's hard. Uh, you know, it was one of the things that was clear from uh, sort of the material and uh, discussions that, uh, that you shared and some of the notes. It's like, this is hard work to do. Uh, and so part of what we're trying to do is to make it a little bit easier. And part of what we're trying to do is to make it a little bit more uh, direct in a sense. So the idea is that there are a number of community organizations out there who are working on topics that uh, are relevant to uh, this plan and this planning process. And that the initial process that we would go through, uh, working with Gazikaya primarily and Stephanie uh, as well, um, would be to uh, reach out to a number of uh, people, representatives of those organizations to either participate directly in uh, the work tasks or to feed information and, and interaction into the task groups. Uh, and there may be ways that we support that as well through, uh, through our contract. Uh, and um, uh, and that that's the, the sort of initial way of interacting with setting goals, with some of the work that's going to take a little thought and some interaction with the committee and with other uh, staff members. Uh, before we go to the process of really talking to individual community members, that we want to build some trust. We want to build some sets of relationships. Uh, those relationships could be durable because they're participating in decision-making processes uh, and, um, and try and build authentic relationships in the process that will serve the rollout, the, the actions that happen out of this plan. Uh, you know, uh, Jesse, I think, made a, uh, an Ashwin made really great points about, you know, the, like the buildings that we're talking about, uh, 90% of them or 95% of them are privately owned. So there's gonna have to be people who wanna participate and 
just the way transportation works within the town and within the region is really a set of individual decisions and family decisions. And there's gonna to have to be ways in which we build relationships to drive the kinds of changes we're looking for uh, forward. And, and the, other, the other real point about that is that we really need to set, uh, set the goals of what is it we're looking for with a pretty wide set of ears, right? we want lots of people participating in what those goals are uh, that we're trying to solve, that we're trying to reach in this process. Um, and so that's sort of the model is we start with uh, organizations, we start with representatives of organizations uh, that uh, can participate in a sort of small scale way. Uh, and then we move on later in the press into a much wider uh, more sort of regularized uh, sort of engagement process. Uh, Stephanie, you want to move on? Time, project timeline. This is always a good one. Woo! So, right. <laughs> um, sorry for the small font. Um, everyone will be able to review this in more detail um, when Stephanie sends out the slides afterwards. Um, but the Basic gist. So we've talked about phase one and sort of what we see there. Oh, great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so thinking about um, initiating outreach to some of these potential community partners, um, forming the sector task groups, and then having um, these other analyses by our partners around procurement um, and infrastructure resilience around soil carbon and soil health um, and doing a lot of the groundwork to set up community participation in phase two. Um, so phase one we really see as sort of developing the framework for how this plan will move forward and then phase two which will start mid-June mid to late June um, will be strategy development. So this is where the meat of the, um, I'm vegan, I shouldn't say meat, the bulk of <laughs> the um, strategy development will happen. Um, most of the task group meetings, we want to kick them off in, at the end of phase one, but the, the task group meetings will really mostly be um, happening in phase two. Um, and then later in phase two, if feasible, hopefully it will be by then, um, having some of those larger community meetings. Um, and then throughout that process, thinking about evaluation, monitoring, tracking progress, and how we're embedding that into the plan, and of course, consolidating all the outcomes and feedback from those meetings, which will then all feed into phase three, which is really about plan development. Um, so that will start around, I think we have it set for October, November, um, and that's where we take all the strategies that have been um, developed and prioritize them, present that to this group, uh, and really start drafting the plan. Um, so that's sort of the timeline that we're working with now. Of course, um, things may shift given uh, the situation with the pandemic, but this is sort of how we see things unfolding. Um, yeah, I think that's probably um, good for that. Any questions? Just quick about questions about, uh, about schedule or any, any of those. So I think where it differs from um, the original uh, schedule in our proposal is really that um, phase one, because we're not in a position right now to be able to um, have meetings right now, uh, public meetings right now, we're, we're concentrating that in, in phase two. Um, but otherwise, pretty much aligned with the original proposal. So, yeah, great, go ahead, Darcy. Is, what, is there any reason why we can't have virtual meetings? Uh, outreach meetings? And I'm, I'm asking that because I, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we won't be able to have outreach in-person meetings in the fall either. I, I would agree with that. Um, and the answer is no, but 
the the real the the thing we're concerned about is um, that in order to really uh, bring people into the process, there, there has to, the the relationships there there has to be some time of building relationships, um, and because we can't you know pull groups of people and go visit different things and go visit churches and uh, you know sort of all those ways in which you build trust that we're sort of counting on this uh, working with organizations process to build that. And I also think sort of, so that sort of, that will happen virtually, right? Uh, and um, the, the other part of that is I also think that it's, it's a process that gets uh, that representation, if you will, although it's sort of a silly word in this case, but gets representation into the process of setting goals, which is going to be very hard to do at a public level. Uh, and so it has two advantages. One of them is that uh, it builds the trust that we need in order to do bigger uh, um, sort of gatherings or meetings, and whether those happen virtually or not. Uh, and the other is that it, um, it actually works well for this process uh, for in, in the same way that the committee itself uh, is effective because it's not huge. It's the people who really care uh, that that sort of same process works uh, in, in the task group formation. I'd like to jump in if I could on this issue because yeah. um, I've been involved in meetings that have tried to be inclusive and include translation, and it has been virtually impossible. I don't think there are any, at least available to us at this time, there is no real platform that works well to incorporate inclusivity in a way that is meaningful. Um, and I'm my personal hope is that working with stakeholder groups engages us with the community, with folks that work within the community in ways that are direct um, that can bring some of that participation to the beginning of this process while we're in this situation. Um, but also I'm hoping that over that time, there will be ways to engage, like some of the technology will evolve very rapidly because I think there are some opportunities out there. I just don't think we've been able to incorporate them quite yet. So I'm hoping that there'll be time um, to, it gives us, buys us a little more time to work on that, to try to make it a more inclusive process. Um, so that, you know, when we get into sort of the phase two of the next fiscal year and we're a little further, further on, we can bring more to the community and make it a more equitable process. Um, but we just literally, I just don't think the technology is available to us right now. I, like I said, I've been in meetings that have attempted it and it's failed. Um, pretty dramatically. So um, it's pretty noticeable. And it's frustrating, like to me, this piece um, is one of the most frustrating because I feel like the whole point of this, especially after what we did with the MVP planning process was to be very inclusive. So it's struck me how um, this digital divide uh, is really, in a, it, there's a lot of inequity just by the virtue of the technology we're we're having to use to be able to communicate and even hold meetings. So um, that's just my my two cents on that. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, and I can tell you that in other settings, so really specifically, we're working on a project which is completely about community interaction in Medford. And we are trying like hell to make it happen and it's just not gonna happen. Uh, uh, and for just this reason, it's like, you know, working with Haitian families, uh, in Medford and it's like, you, you know, can't count on anybody having internet connections, much less, uh, you know, multiple computers in the house in order that the kids can do schoolwork and the parents can be on a zoom meeting. Uh, um, so it's th those kinds of issues really weigh heavily on, on a process like this. Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to work a process that gets us some real authentic interaction and participation, uh, but 
is less weighted by the those issues, if that makes sense. Um, Gazette, Chaya, you you have a, your hand up, and then Andra. Oh, there you go. Hey everyone, I, I don't have video right now, but I was just gonna throw in another two cents echoing what Jim said about access to technology, access to internet, and also there are cultural barriers to folks having um, a the presence of someone else in their home uh, via video or audio, that there are more complex than are worth going into right now, but there are cultural barriers to that. Yeah, I think that's a great comment, uh, Kazukaya, that, uh that the you know we sort of have this vision of of what our world is like uh and as we've seen <laughs> boy have we seen it uh you know uh our the worlds that we think are like oh well, it's you know it's just me and i happen to be in my office right now you get to see the nice office you know you you what you know kids and and spouses on the phone and even even our world is not what you would think it would be and uh and there are plenty of things in, in everybody else's world that uh, are probably not ideal either. Andra, do you have something to add? Um, so, um, yeah, I don't think that we should be trying to work with fancy technology. I think we should get on the phone. That's the way to organize right now. And um, everyone has a phone. And it is a more chaotic time, but if you, you know, get somebody for 15, 20 minutes on the phone, you can, with a real, you know, directed kind of conversation, you, you can make some use of it. Um, but I'm thinking about how right now, you know, yeah, you can't reach everybody. I know that teachers are having a hard time reaching all of their students. Um, and the teachers may be a really important um, resource for us to use because they are, you know, reaching out to families at least um, in all different, every possible circumstance. Um, so, I'm wondering if we might need to, given what's our situation, might need to shift some resources into actually getting people who are already making calls, trying to reach out to families they are working with, not just organizations, because most people are not actually affiliated with an organization, so yeah. I think we mean working with like, I think like you're bringing up teachers, which is a good example. I don't think anything that was discussed is saying that the initial stakeholder meetings are going to be the one that make the final decisions or provide the only input. It's just a place to get started to maybe identify some things to bring out to more community members. I love the idea. I mean, I, well, I love the idea of the telephone calls, but again, I think it's going to be challenging because, again, you have to, in my mind, these meetings have to include interpretation. And, you know, we have to make sure if we're going to be inclusive that we provide translation for people. So, you know, that's, it's going to be challenging. And I think um, that's why maybe starting with these stakeholder groups where that might not be as much of an issue. Um, and I would consider teachers a stakeholder group at this point, you know, that they are. So um, I think that's a really good point, Andra. I just think we have to, you know, these are details I think we can sort of work out in as we move forward, but just things to bring up, but, but that's a great, a great idea. Yeah, I love that thought. Yeah, I think there's a couple hands up. I think that, um, you know, I think the first step here is, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left of the meeting. So I want to move forward a little bit. We've got, our first step here is really, you know, identifying these task groups and what community members, individual in members or groups we want to bring in to these groups. And we have no idea what, we had no idea a month ago when we last met that we'd be in this situation. We have no idea what a month from now is going to look like. So I think we may end up needing to do outreach over the phone and through other means. Um, 
and I think those are all good ideas that we need to keep on our in our plate but um I don't think we're going to solve those those today um no but the, but the ideas can. I think are valuable yeah 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 and I and I I hope that we can do these meetings in person or at least some of them in person um but I also don't want I think Darcy reading in between your comment I don't want us to wait to hold something in person and hold off the process so I think we need to balance those those things absolutely um, Jesse, oh, you're good okay any any other comments Okay. Great. So Stephanie, you can um, move on to the next slide. Um, given that we only have 10 minutes left, this is really a discussion about um, next steps um, to identify potential task group leaders from the committee and um, maybe start some brainstorming around um, task group members that could also happen offline. Um, and then um, another next step will be to reach out to potential community partners, which will be identified in that brainstorming, um, and that will be led by Gazikaya. Um, and then to schedule the first task group meetings. So that's sort of what we see as our immediate next steps. Um, but I know we wanted to leave some space for more discussion um, at the end. So Jake, yeah. you. Laura, I was just going to say, Laura, um, this is sort of. Um, sort of hand it back to you uh you know we we did talk some about the 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 um ta the task groups and uh I, i'm not sure how you want to handle that uh whether that's something that you uh want to finish up here or whether uh the, you want to you know have some other vision of it um uh i don't know how, what do you think yeah, I think that um, we should, if you could put back up the list of, of uh, the slide that had the task groups on them. Yeah, so that's... Uh, yeah. What I'd like to ask the committee members to do is... There you go. Whoop, um, that was it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> One more. Yeah, there we go. Um is send me make maybe like your first and second choice of what group you want to be in, you'd like to be involved with. Um, to reiterate, I think the vision here is that we'll have ideally two committee members sort of working in each of these task groups. And then we're coming back together as our full committee to, um, to share out and, and help each other. And, and, you know, let's just, start with this these groupings and these task force task groups i think as we start to identify community members we may decide we need to switch these up a little bit or, or something but let's start here for now um so if you guys could email me in the next couple of days just your first and second choice i'll try to make sure i get everybody uh, linked up to a task group um and then we'll need to start and I'll need to talk with Stephanie because we still have to abide by all the open meeting walls about how we um, sort of move forward from there. But my, my hope is that at the next meeting, we've got some task group leads. We've got our sort of our initial list of both individuals and community groups that we want to include in, in these task groups so we can start reaching out and scheduling our first meetings and working on the agenda for what those meetings would look like. Um, so Laura, that's a great um, point too. We, we did um, send Stephanie a draft agenda for our first meeting, what, something that, you know, an idea of what that meeting could look like. Um, and we were gonna take a quick look at that at the end of this presentation as well. Um, and that was something I think we had talked about in our first meeting just to get a sense of um, what that could look like. Um, also, Laura and probably Stephanie, um, do we have a sense of what task groupings might have to um, might have to do in terms of open meeting? Uh, yeah, I um, 
Jim, I think that we're probably going to have to um, advertise them if they are have two members, at least as at, the, at minimum, if there are two members on the on the sector group, right. um, then we're going to have to advertise them. But I'm sort of I've been um, understanding that that's probably going to be the case. So I expect to be posting a whole lot of meetings. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, um, but that's part, you know, we'll just have to have that. Um, that's why I'll have to have a lot of communication with, with each group. Yeah. Okay. And we can think a little bit about how, what, what email communications look like and, and, you know, how, how structured that needs to be uh, and what, whatever is what has to happen. That's great. Well, you know, that's, that's um, sounds good. We did collect a list of uh, local community organizations. Yes. Which we have our, our outreach process. Um, so yep. Hopefully you already have that. Yes, indeed we do. And we also have the ones that we included in the MVP process as well. So um, it should be pretty comprehensive. Yeah, yeah I don't we, know if this falls within something that Lauren or Jim you could do, but if you wanted to take a first stab at splitting those groups into these sectors, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. And we have been looking pretty carefully, Darcy, uh, at that at that list and uh, understanding who everybody was and, you know, sort of digging into who the, who all the groups were. And a number of them we know, all, you know, we know pretty well already. Uh, and then uh, as well, the groups, the, the folks from the MVP process. Uh, and then we've been also looking at some other uh, other uh, sets of folks around um, uh, around town and around the area. I'd like a little more about the um, community and public health piece. I can't imagine the full range of what that might include, like I can the other ones. Mm. Um, Jim, do you want to say more about that or I can jump sure. in? Uh, well, when we did this, uh, we've, we've done this in a couple of other places and um, uh, what uh, happens the, the issues that that fall into that that sort of general set of categories uh there's a lot of stuff around uh um uh disease vectors uh which is a hot topic with in the, in the public health world uh and then there's also uh things uh what also really falls into that category i mean and of course COVID is a great example of that right it's like uh you know, what, what does it mean to be able to sustain a community in a situation where, you know, something is super uh, contagious? Um, uh, but uh, sort of community strength and community activities, community organizations, uh, things that, that create a strong community or create a vulnerable community, uh, those fall into that category as well. Now, Lauren, anything else you want to say? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, as I think Laura said, there'll be some refining and, and, and defining of these um, sector groups, but other things that come to mind for me are things around um, like waste and sustainable consumption. We're talking a lot about culture shift in this conversation and what that looks like. Um, and then also potentially food justice and food systems, um, although that does intersect with the land use agriculture piece as well. Um, but like thinking about the sort of more societal components of those um, those issues and addressing those from the, the perspective of the community, I think will probably be important, especially in Amherst. Where does where does consumption and waste reduction fall in this in those sectors groups? Yeah, we've been debating that one. Um, I think a case could be made for multiple different areas um, when you think about waste infrastructure versus the impacts of waste on public health um, you know land use it, it's um, yeah it's it's whatever. either uh, from our perspective waste uh, so consumption is definitely within the community and public health realm uh, waste itself as a um, is probably in that category uh, although there's probably some argument to me, you know, from the from it, from the city, if if uh, if the town of Amherst 
uh, is dealing with waste as, you know, sort of one of the sort of services uh, that, you know, is kind of like roads and schools and uh, that then, well, it probably falls into infrastructure. So there's probably, we might, you know, as part of, as a committee, we might decide, oh, waste really falls in community or eh, waste really falls in, in uh, infrastructure. But, uh, and this is always the case, you know, you're always in these situations where you, you always end up back at the point where you sort of say, well, why don't we just have one committee that has everything? Uh, and it's because it's too much to do. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to Jesse's diagram. I liked that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All connected, so it's very hard to sometimes break it out into specific categories, but. Um, so we do our best and, you know, we, we do what we can and, uh, and try and make sure that, you know, there's enough communication that things that cross boundaries are pretty well handled. Have you all written up anything? Um, I can't remember, Lauren, if, if you had written up anything more that included the pieces that you think would be in each of these sectors. Um, I did send Stephanie um, an overview, which I'm sure we can share, um, of what this first phase would look like that has a little bit yeah. more detail there. Yeah. OK, maybe we can circulate that. Um, yeah. Definitely. With the with the names of the of the sectors, and then um, and also task you if possible with with sort of the first stab of of breaking into the the different community groups that might or stakeholders that might fit into the, these different task groups. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually, Azikai has already been doing some great thinking about that, so I think we're off on a good foot there. Great. Um. So I'll follow up with an email with with that, or Stephanie will. Um, and so in terms of the agenda for the next meeting, it will be really sort of working forward to have our first task group meeting um, and narrow down those task groups a little bit more. Does anybody have anything else they want to add for the agenda for next time? Might, we might want to um, just figure out where um, where the town is with the budget and see if we need to do any advocacy on our budget request. Good, good idea. Anybody else? Um, some of us looked at um, other climate action plans. I think um, we should probably have some highlights from each of us, what we read. Yeah, great idea. Uh, we were going to do that at the beginning. We totally, uh, totally forgot about it. So sorry. That's okay. We can, uh, we can do that. All right. Any, anything else? I'm about to get kicked off. Thank you so much, Linnean, uh, for driving out to Amherst. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be there. You know, I really miss driving out to Amherst. It's really a bummer. It's a, uh, yeah. But thank you really to see everybody. And thank you. Uh, it's, you know, it's a very exciting process. Yeah, great to meet everyone, see familiar faces, and looking forward to the next steps. Good to see you, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. All right. All right. Yep. Thank you all. So, Laura, you and I should follow up on Friday? That sounds good. Okay. Okay. Bye, Bye, everybody. Nice to see you all. Bye. Be well. Bye. Bye, everybody.